Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I will be answering all your questions about YouTube. I posted a poll in my Instagram stories asking if you had any questions about being a YouTuber and you guys really came through. So if you have been following my channel, you would know that last year I quit my corporate law nine to five job to be a stay at home mom. And so it has been quite a transition, but I am here and I am ready to answer all your questions. So let's just jump into the first question. Do you miss your corporate job now that you're a stay at home mom? And the answer to that is no. <laughs> I love being home. I love finally being there when my kids come home. I love not rushing in the morning, getting myself ready, getting the kids ready, dropping the kids off at daycare. I don't miss daycare costs at all. We were living in a very high cost of living city. Daycare prices were exorbitant. At one point I had two babies in full-time daycare and then my older son had just started grade school, but I needed to put him in before care and after care. So basically four daycares <laughs> going on. It was, it was insane. The price of daycare is just astronomical. So I don't miss that at all. I definitely do not miss daycare. I just love being at home. I feel like I missed out a little bit on my two growing up. And so I'm glad that I'm finally home and I'm just, I'm so glad to be home. So no, I don't miss my corporate job. I do miss my friends that I made at work, but I'm still in touch with them. So we get to hang out and talk without having to deal with you know work or at least they still are, but I'm not. <laughs> so I don't miss, I don't miss that. No, I do not. What is your filming schedule now that you're a full-time YouTuber? Love your channel. Oh, thank you, Amber. That was from Amber Ashley. Check out her channel. She's one of my YouTube buddies. So my filming schedule before was actually very consistent. My corporate job, I was working what's called a 980 schedule. So I'd work nine hour days and then every other Friday I was off. And so that Friday I was very diligent about batch filming anywhere from two to three to four videos in that one day. And then I would edit in the evenings and on weekends and just in my spare time <laughs> early in the morning at the gym. I just, that was my schedule. So I would film all day Friday my every other Friday and then edit just throughout the week whenever I could. So my schedule now is not really in place yet. I'm still figuring it out. I know it's been at this point something like six months, but I really don't have it down because part of it is guilt. You know, I still feel like, well, the whole point of me quitting my corporate law job was I wanted to stay at home with the kids. So I don't want to take time away from my family when I can be, you know, enjoying time with them. Every Friday night is movie night. We stay at home, we make popcorn, we watch a movie together. I don't want to take away from my time with them. And I really want to cherish my time. So I try to film during the day when the kids are at school and that's pretty much it. <laughs> so I guess I, I just try to film during the day and I did start outsourcing my editing and this was before I quit my job. I started finally outsourcing my editing up until then I was filming everything and editing on my iPhone and then uploading it from my iPhone. I need to outsource the work that can be done by others. So now I'm no longer staying up at night editing videos until two in the morning and I'm not spending all weekend day editing or you know doing last minute whatever work that needs to be done. I try to get everything done during the week when my kids are in school. So that's my schedule now. Equipment needed, editing apps used, estimated cost to start. Okay, so I know I talked about this in, in one of my videos, but when I first started my YouTube channel, I went in with the intention of spending as little amount as possible on my channel. You know, because I wanted whatever I ended up making, I wanted that to be all 100% profit. So I didn't want to invest money into an expensive camera or an expensive mic or whatever else you needed. I didn't even have a laptop until just last year. And then I only finally bought a dedicated camera, which I have linked below, it's great. I only bought that when I was something like 50,000 subscribers in. Everything was done on my iPhone, which I already just had my personal use. So I filmed on my iPhone. I edited on my iPhone using iMovie, which is a free movie editing software. And then I uploaded from my iPhone directly to the YouTube app. <laughs> so I didn't have a laptop, I didn't have anything. I think after the first month or so, I did invest in a $17 Boya lapel mic, which is this mic that I have right here. And I still have it. I think I need to upgrade it though, because I, I think it's starting to break down. <laughs> but that was pretty much all you need. But even then you don't need to do that. You can use your iPhone mic. But for me, I think audio is a lot more important than you know the camera. You really don't need a fancy camera and, the, and iPhones are so good now. So if you wanna start a channel, just get started. I've been putting this off, but I do plan on filming a video with tips about starting a YouTube channel. I highly recommend it. 
and just don't put a lot of money into it. Just use what you have, just put it out there, practice using iMovie and just see what you come up with without spending any money. A lot of these questions are similar, so I'll kind of group some of them together. This one I thought was so funny. Who is the most excited for your success? Your mom, your husband? <laughs> And then um, similarly, does your husband watch your videos? I would say it's so funny because those two are probably the most likely answers. Who is the most excited for your success, your mom or your husband? So my husband does not watch my videos <laughs> to answer the other question. He just doesn't watch my videos. He's not really into it. He is supportive, you know, but he's from a different generation. He's older than me and he just doesn't really get YouTube, I think he uses it when he needs it. And our kids are, you know, they watch YouTube videos for kids. So he sees the amount of views that videos can get. He sees, you know, Ryan's toys video is a billionaire, I think. Once I started <laughs> earning a significant, I guess, revenue, that's when he was like, oh, okay, this is legit. Like, this is legit. You know, he's not interested in the subject matter. He's not into luxury bags. He's not into luxury or fashion or beauty. So he doesn't watch it, but he appreciates my success on YouTube. But yes, I would say definitely my mom is my biggest cheerleader. She lives on the other side of the world. She's in the Philippines and she watches my videos religiously. And what's so funny is she even got my dad to watch my videos and he is way older and doesn't understand technology. But she shared with me that she told him that he should also be watching my videos because I get paid, you know, with every view, which isn't necessarily true. And I'll get into that later. And he was like, oh, okay. So she said now he plays my videos all the time in the house, <laughs> you know, from different devices, different TVs. And I just think that is so sweet and just so supportive of him because he's definitely not interested in anything that I talk about on my channel, but he just likes to support me also. So yeah, I would say the biggest cheerleaders for my YouTube success are my mom and then I guess my dad by default. What inspired you to begin your YouTube channel? Now, I have mentioned this somewhere in one of my other videos, but I would say definitely what inspired me to start my channel was Shea Whitney and Beauty and the Vlog podcast, Erica Vieira. I just started listening to them and watching Shea Whitney's videos. And then I heard Shea Whitney's interview on Erica Vieira's podcast. The podcast is called YouTube Power Hour. It used to be called Beauty and the Vlog because she used to focus solely on beauty YouTubers, but now she's opened it up to just all women YouTubers, I guess. So Erica interviewed Shay Whitney, and this was before Shay Whitney blew up. She's at over a million subscribers now, but this was before, I think she was at 200 or something. But she talked about how she was doing YouTube and she was working a full-time job and she had two boys and she had a government job. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can relate to all those things <laughs> because prior to my corporate law job, I did work a government law job. I worked for JAG and I was like, if she can do it, I can totally do this. And I have three kids, you know? I mean, it's just totally doable. And I just was like, okay, I'm, I just need to do this. Like, I just need to start this YouTube channel. And I'm just so glad I did. If you are interested in starting a YouTube channel yourself, I highly recommend listening to Erica Vera's YouTube Power Hour podcast. It is super helpful. She interviews other successful YouTubers and they just get into all the secrets. And there's just such a great advice that really helped me to start my own. Do you make contracts with the companies you advertise? So I don't make contracts directly. The way it works is if a brand wants to work with me or sponsor me, they will generally send a contract over for me to sign. Now, what is interesting is I read, obviously I read every single line of the contract and I send it back sometimes with red lines or deletions or suggested edits. And it's amazing how this industry has kind of blown up. And there are a lot of younger creators who, you know, aren't familiar with contracts and legal terms and will just sign whatever is given to them. But because of my job, I read through contracts all the time. I can immediately see poorly <laughs> written contracts, clauses that hurt the creator, terms that are very restrictive, very prohibitive and I do not recommend that you work with them. I have turned down contracts. There was one company that approached me and I had worked with them before and it was fine, but then they wanted to do more work and so they sent a contract. And when I looked at it, I was like, no, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> what they wanted was, and this is common with a lot of influencer type contracts, they wanted me to sign a non-compete. So for the duration of the contract, they wanted to prohibit me from working with other competitive brands. Yeah, so if you're going to restrict someone from working with another company or any competitive company, and also the term competitive 
they define as any brand that they believed is competitive. So they basically were inserting this term that they themselves would define and was pretty ambiguous. There are just so many pitfalls in that kind of language. It just was not going to work. And so I respectfully requested to cross it out. And the other person insisted that their lawyer said it was okay. And so when I'm doing these negotiations, I'm working with you know the influencer relations manager or whoever their title is, the person who does the outreach for PR and for influencers. And I was letting them know that I would sign this, but only if they struck the non-compete clause. And she was very nice, but she said, oh no, our lawyer said it's not a non-compete. She said something that it was, but it wasn't, you know? And when you have those verbal asides in emails that directly contradict the terms of the contract, that's when you're in big trouble because then you can't later go and say, oh, but in the email they said this because you're signing the four corners of the document and in the document, in the contract, it says that I will not work with any other brand that X company believes to be a competitor. So that's something that is just so overly broad. I just, I can't do it and I don't recommend others do it. So yes, do you make contracts with the companies you advertise? Again, generally, I don't make the contracts. They are provided for me to sign as the talent. But in many cases, I send it back with just a ton of red lines and we figure out a happy medium. How do you plan and organize your content? Okay, 2022 is the year that I'm trying to be a lot more organized. And I have a system, okay? <laughs> and I'm gonna show it to you right now. So I have this little notebook. This is a little Dior notebook. I have a little sticker that says book of ideas. And this is where I write down, it's basically like a brainstorming session. And I write down in list form, all the ideas that come into my little brain. I write them down essentially as the title, sometimes as the video. And then I just write down just different iterations and things that I think would be interesting, things I wanna talk about, things I think my viewers would wanna watch. I just write it down. So that's what this entire book is about. Then I take one of the ideas and I use this larger notebook. So this is the small book of ideas. And then this is my larger notebook. It's another Dior notebook I like for them to match. I have a little Chanel sticker on there. And then in this notebook, this is where I basically script the video. So I'll have the title, you know, Chanel 22P collection, what's in my travel bag, whatever video I plan to do next. And then in that page and then the next page or two, it's usually just one page. I don't really script videos, at least not verbatim. It's mostly like bullet outline, you know, main ideas, things I wanna make sure I include prices because a lot of times they can get jumbled up. So I basically just outline the video in the larger notebook. And then I have this passion planner. Now this is like a mix of an agenda. So this is basically a mix of my YouTube planning schedule mixed with Instagram to make sure that I haven't missed anything else. I really like Passion Planner. It just, I think the outline and the, the way it's set up makes so much sense. You have your personal to-do list, you have your work to-do list, and then each week is broken out, you know, each day, literally by hour. And it can be as strict or as vague as you want it to be. You have this week's focus. You don't have to answer all the frilly stuff, but this is just really helpful for me for planning my schedule kind of which I still haven't gotten down, but I'm trying. So this year I'm really trying. So that is how I schedule my content. Probably the most asked about question on here is about money and I'll kind of group them all together. I'm not gonna be able to answer all these questions. I think I might have to do a part two, but for now, could you afford living only from YouTube? Yes, I make a pretty decent income from YouTube now. And then the next question, I'm gonna just put it out there. I do plan on doing a follow-up video with the actual breakdown because it gets really complicated and it varies. Every month is different. But the next question is, how much do you make each month as a YouTuber and yearly? Okay, I'm gonna just give you the numbers, guys, because we are all about transparency here. And I wrote it down. The numbers vary all throughout the year. And because of the subject matter of my video, it's basically about fashion, style, beauty. A lot of people follow me because they want a great deal or to save money or they're just interested in my stories. I have a lot of fun LV story times. Because the amount varies every month, it's hard to gauge and project how much you'll make during the year until you get your 1099 from Google, which is the company that pays us out. Our, we receive Google AdSense. That is what our YouTube revenue is. And in addition to that, I make whatever I make that month from affiliate links, various affiliate commissions and links. And then on top of that, I make some sponsorships. I don't really have a lot of sponsorships. And to be honest, there are a lot of sponsorship requests that I don't take because it completely has nothing to do with my channel. So how much do I make monthly? 
varies greatly on the month because the way YouTube AdSense revenue works, you don't get paid out per view, you get paid out based on what the ads are in your videos. And so if the company that wants to place ads in your video pay more, then you end up making more. And so this is how in some videos I actually can make more than other videos that actually have more views, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? <laughs> it gets really tricky. So my revenue for the month can vary anywhere from $1,000 to probably my best performing month total was the end of last year from AdSense and then my affiliate commissions. And then I had a couple of sponsorships. The total that I made for that month was $27,000. So just take that for what it is. Again, that is not a guaranteed amount. Ad revenue is significantly increased during the holiday shopping months, October, November, December. That's what helps out a lot. And also people are shopping more, so they're shopping affiliate links more, but that is how much I made that month. And that is not how much I would make every month. But I promise to do a breakdown showing you the analytics. There are a lot of YouTube analytics that show the breakdown of how much each video makes, how much you've made the past 28 days, the past six months, the past year, it just, it's very interesting. So I'll answer all those questions in another video and I will answer more of your YouTube Q&A questions because there were a lot more I wasn't able to respond to. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for asking all your questions and I will catch you in the next video. Bye.